when we have that unexpected, dramatic, isolating, no strategy event, the brain goes, okay, what does this mean about me? And what does this mean about life or the event? This is Gene Monterestelli. Welcome to the Tapping Q&A podcast recorded live to tape from Williamsburg in Brooklyn. This is episode 229, originally aired July 13th, 2016. Hi, everyone. I hope this finds you well wherever you are and whatever time of day you're getting a chance to listen to this. Thanks for spending some time with me today. As you just heard, today we're going to be talking about traumatic instances and how that trauma affects us and what we can do to tap for that. Because the nature of today's subject, I just want to get the housekeeping out of the way. First of all, if you have not done it already, you need to sign up for our free 10-part guide for using tapping to stop self-sabotage. There are audios, there's articles, there's tap-alongs. It's absolutely free. Every few days, you receive another piece. We have it broken up into a number of steps over days, so you're not overwhelmed by it. All you need to do is go to tappingqa.com and click on the big blue button, and you will have an opportunity to be able to get that guide. The other thing I'd like to mention is the sponsor for today's show, which is Pain Relief Miracle. Pain Relief Miracle is an all-natural spray, which is created by traditional Chinese medicine practitioner Jason Laird, a buddy of mine who I grew up with. And he originally created it because he wanted to to take care of some pain that his mother was dealing with with her arthritis. Not only does it work for things like arthritis, joint pain, sore muscles, it's also great for skin conditions. It does amazing work on bed sores, on cuts, on scrapes, on bruises. Last week, I was in California with my family on vacation. I did a good job of making sure I took care of my sunblock. Some of the members of my family did not, and they asked me if I had PRM with them because they had not brought any along, and I did. It is amazing for sunburns as well. If you would like to get 33% off your first purchase of Pain Relief Miracle, all you need to do is go to tappingqna.com slash pain. That's tappingqna.com slash pain. So for today's conversation, it has been a really long couple of weeks in the world. If you have been paying attention to the news, today's interview is with Jen Goddard and Jen had originally reached out to me because she lives in the Orlando area and she wanted to have us do a conversation about how we can use tapping in response to major traumatic events. And just because of some timing issues, we didn't get an opportunity to do it after Orlando. And if you think back, at least here in the United States and internationally what's going on in Europe, The number of tragedies that have happened in the short period of time since Orlando. Because that's the case, uh, we decided to do the interview in a more general way. So this is really useful for any sort of traumatic experience that you're dealing with. It could be big T traumas like stuff that is happening in the world. It could be little T traumas, things that are happening to you day to day. It's a really useful conversation in looking at what makes something traumatic, why it impacts us. And when you understand those things, it's going to give you an entryway to tap on it. And then we talk about how you can approach it really simply with tapping. Our conversation was recorded over Skype and it was a doozy far of technology. I did the best that I could to clean it up. You might hear some scratches and some bleeps and some bloops through it, but I have gotten it to a place where it is more than sufficient so you'll be able to hear and understand everything that we are saying. So here's my conversation with Jen about dealing with trauma. What happens internally, biologically and mentally when we bump into something that is traumatic? There are a lot of things that happen when we go through trauma. And the brain is radically affected. Um, Trauma creates chaos in our brain. The amygdala is a small part of the almond-shaped portion of the brain, and it is the emotional center of the brain. It is a primitive part of the brain, and it interprets messages that are dangerous, and it's not safe. When we see something, you know, that is traumatic, and we feel the effects of it, and we're going through life 
there are four things that we we experience that cause or is the effect of a trauma. And in the EFT world, we call it a Yuda moment. It's unexpected, it's dramatic, it's isolating, and there's no strategy. So a trauma doesn't have to be something radically big, but the bigger it is, obviously the worse it is and the more havoc it wreaks on your brain and your nervous system and your body as well. I, I really like when we get a chance to, to look at things through those four things. Just for clarity so that everybody is on the same page, I want you to take those four parts and just define them one at a time. So say, say it and say a little bit about each one. Sure. So it's unexpected. So, um, for example, there's a, a, a large event that occurs, you know, um, obviously a, a bombing in an airport or, you know, a shooting at a nightclub or, you know, a shooting at a school. You know, these are things that unfortunately are starting to become more common, but it's still extremely unexpected. We don't really expect these events to occur. And when anything becomes unexpected, then that that wreaks havoc on our nervous system. The next one is dramatic. It is something that is going to create a lot of emotion inside of you. So if it's an event that is getting broadcast on the news and you're seeing lots of fo- uh, lots of posts on Facebook and social media about it, that is a dramatic situation. There's a lot of intense emotions happening and it, it's moving rapidly through the different media sources. Sometimes I've heard when we're going through this, instead of using dramatic, people will use extreme to describe it as just another way, another lens of looking at that. The next one is it's isolating. There is a feeling that you are all alone in that moment and you don't know where to go with this. You don't know what to do. You're in shock. And so you might not have anybody to talk to about the situation or there is just this feeling of being really alone. And it might not even be alone as a person, but it might be a feeling of alone in this universe that there's not a, a, a bigger entity around us trying to protect us or keeping us safe from the situations. So there's a huge feeling of isolation that can happen and can occur in that situation. Um, even if there are people around and helping, you can feel very isolated in. And then the last one is there's no strategy. And so you don't know what to do. You don't know how to protect yourself in a future situation. You don't know where to go from the situation right now. Um, Again, if we're looking at these events of what's happening in the airport, the brain goes, okay, I'm going to travel back through the airport again. I don't have a strategy. How do I keep myself safe from these situations? And if there's no answer for it, then it creates a lot of intense emotions and the logical part of our brain kind of shuts down and that amygdala part of our brain or the primitive part of our brain becomes hyper vigilant and hyper um, reactive to what's going on. And we start to think in a very fearful state of mind and it can cause all kinds of anxiety, emotional issues. It can cause physical issues and be very damaging to us. So I think one of the things that's really interesting about the way that you've laid out those things, the first three of them, unexpected, dramatic, and isolating, all three of those are relative. They're not absolute. That what I think is unexpected, you might not think is unexpected. What I think is extreme, you might not think is extreme. Um, I can remember hearing studies after one of the bombings that happened in the London subway system. And one of the ways they could tell how dramatically traumatized people were and if they were going to be experiencing PTSD after the fact was whether or not they were able to get a text message out to a loved one and get a response back. And they're in a circumstance where they were trapped with lots of other people But since they didn't know them, they felt really isolated in that moment. So the isolation had nothing to do with their proximity to other human beings. It had to do with a connection with a trusted loved one. And so if they got word back over text, hey, I'm okay, great to hear from you, then they stopped feeling isolated because they were connected. So it didn't have to do with proximity. It had to do with connection. And that's a relative thing. It's something that is completely interpreted by the person who's experiencing it. 
you know, it, it, and you're right. And, you know, I always tell people that it doesn't have to be big. And it may sound funny, but even a kid being in a classroom in the front of the classroom and they're up there and their zipper is down, you know, and they're supposed to be giving a presentation that they're already scared about doing. You know, it's unexpected. It's dramatic. It's isolating in that moment. And they don't know what to do. So, you know, there's lots of things that can happen. And you're right. It's relative to each person. One person could laugh that off. And to another person, it could be absolutely devastating. You know, so it, it it's all unique to us. And I think the other thing that I find fascinating about that is it's almost as if when we're going back and we're tapping and we're doing work on this sort of thing, that if it is something that is big, you know, I was attacked, then it's really easy for me to identify that as a traumatic experience. When it's something small, like being a child talking in front of the classroom and having my zipper down, intellectually, I'm able to go, oh, that's really just no big deal. And in the moment, it was traumatic and it had all of the characteristics. But after the fact, I'm dismissive of it because it seems so small. And sometimes I find... At least when, I'm work, when, when people are working on their own, I find it harder for them to be successful because they dismiss that sensitizing event as the thing that's actually the problem because intellectually on the other side, we see it as no big deal and we just brush it off. But in the moment, it was all of those components combined. Absolutely. You know, it's when I hear people that come to me and they've been to um, therapy before or they've, you know, gone to somebody else before. And, you know, they say, oh, yeah, I had that other event, but I already dealt with that. And I'm like, okay, well, let's look back at that again. And 99% of the time, they didn't deal with it correctly. They kind of swept over it or they just, they felt like they were, they, they passed through it. And, you know, there's a lot of those events that we have in childhood and throughout life that we think that we, we just, we brush over and we're okay and we're not those are the things that leave strong imprints in our psyche. And ask, and we ask these big questions when these things happen. So when we have that unexpected, dramatic, isolating, no strategy event, the brain goes, okay, what does this mean about me? And what does this mean about life or the event? And so sometimes we come to conclusions that don't necessarily support us. And you know, well, I'm not safe, or it's never okay to speak in front of people again, or it's never safe to go to the airport or again, or I'm not safe anywhere. So when we, we are processing these traumas and we don't work through the emotional aspects of it, what happens is we make decisions out of fear, and this is what gets us in trouble. I think the other thing that's fascinating inside of that is that last component, the no strategy piece. In the moment when we're surprised by something, typically in that moment of surprise, we don't have access to our full resource state and all of our faculties. And so even though we might normally have a strategy that would be really useful for dealing with that, we're not drawing on the strategy in that particular moment. And because we're not drawing on that strategy in that particular moment, after the fact, we can be really hard on ourselves because we look at this thing that went wrong and we go, oh, I should have, I could have. Normally I know how to deal with this stuff. And so we take this event that was hard and we're now compounding it by being hard on ourselves for recognizing the things that we could have done that we didn't do in that particular moment. That's correct. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that originally didn't deal with the 9-11 attack in New York City, and they, well, it didn't happen to me directly, but because of the decisions that they made or the decisions that they didn't make about it, they carry guilt and they carry resentment or frustration with themselves because they were in a traumatic state and they weren't in a place of being able to make good decisions. And so they've made, you know, decisions that they're not so happy with, and it makes it hard for them to forgive or to move on. So Again, when we have these events in our life, it's extremely important to be able to work through these processes. And I think the other thing that's important for us to recognize when we look at this is that we don't have to be directly in the line of fire in order for us to be traumatized by an event. 
that if we see something like a shooting at a nightclub, a shooting at a school, something that's happening at an airport, because we participate in those things as well, and we relate to the victims who are going through something like that, it's possible for us to be traumatized in a moment where we're simply getting the news and the information about the event, even if we're not in the middle of what's going on. Absolutely. There's, um, there's a few studies out there as well that talks about what happens to people when they watch the news first thing in the morning. And if they watch a certain amount of the news in the morning, um, and, and they're already someone who is easily affected by dramatic situations and stuff, the rest of their day can be shot just by these events. They can feel triggered. And, you know, the news is set up to evoke emotion out of people. And when you're constantly being exposed to these situations, yes, absolutely. You're constantly getting traumatized by these situations as well. The other thing, when you were initially going over the kind of the, the, four, the four points, um, you talked about one of the consequences that if we have this happen to us and the consequence is all of a sudden we become hyper vigilant and we start worrying about stuff all the time. And it makes sense because we've gone through this experience where I was surprised by something that was completely unexpected and it put me into a really dangerous place. Therefore, on a subconscious level, the way that I'm going to spin that around is I'm going to be on guard every single moment of the day. And because I'm on guard every single moment of the day, then there's no way that I can get in trouble. And so as a strategy, it might seem useful, but what is the the consequence? What goes wrong if we're living in a state where we're constantly on edge like that? If you're constantly in a state, a state of hypervigilance and always worrying about what's going wrong, your mind is now aggressively affecting your body and your body your, your, your blood pressure is going to rise, your temperature of your body is going to rise, your, um, your, you're going to get issues with your digestion that's going to start to happen. Your whole body is going to start to become affected and your thinking across the board is also going to be, be affected as well. And you're not going to be able to make logical choices or uh, decisions based on what you're seeing. Most of your decisions are going to start to be made out of fear. When we realize we have been through something like this, maybe we realized it in the moment because it was super extreme, or maybe we don't realize it in the moment because it, it, it isn't something that we would have looked at as being this really big thing, but it is now impacting us regularly. How do we respond to something like this? Like what, what is the skills that we use? How do we tap for something like this? Well, I think one of the most important things to do is to tap and meet somebody right where they're at. And the big thing you want to do with that type of tapping is to, I, I try to work with those four pieces of, of the union moment, which is the unexpected, the dramatic, the isolating, and no strategy. So uh, it's the starting point of where someone's at. And so we do some general tapping of tapping on, you know, the it's unexpected. These are the emotions that I'm feeling from the situation. And, you know, I feel alone inside. I don't know where to go. So we start working through all four of those parts and allow the person to process right where they're at and recognize everything that they're feeling and then move down through the specifics of it. So it sounds like the beginning is we're going to take them and have them describe this is unexpected because and this is how I feel because it is unexpected. This is dramatic because this is how I feel because it was that way. And just in a kind of a systematic way, working through those four for whatever shows up, then getting into the details of what's going on. Yeah. I, I try to be a little bit more organic with it, mm -hmm. but you know, in, in the process of doing it, I do, I make sure I cover all of those different things. The big thing I want to make sure is that the person doesn't feel alone. And so a lot of times like I've got someone you know, that is not in front of me. I want them to know, even though I'm not in front of you right now, I am here with you and I'm not alone in this moment. And, you know, I, I've, I've got support and I'm help and I'm okay. And so I try to emphasize whatever that person might be struggling with a little bit more, whether it's the isolation part of it or just the unexpected and what that means. But I, I want to cover all four of those areas in that first round of tapping so that we can kind of 
get that person, their nervous system to calm down. Because if you can't get the nervous system to calm down, then you're the, you're going to have a hard time getting the person to process through uh, the rest of what's going on. And I think that point about helping folks not feel isolated, I think that's just a good point for us to keep in mind anytime that we're just being present, not even necessarily tapping with someone else. Because when we're in some sort of hypercharged emotional space, we're not seeing things clearly and we're just experiencing that emotion. And to simply be in the circumstance to say, you know, if that happened to me, I would feel angry too. If that happened to me, I would feel sad too. And just spending a small amount of time validating their experience is going to help them immediately feel less isolated because they're, even if it's not something I am feeling and I'm not empathizing with you, by simply recognizing what's going on and, and validating what you're experiencing, it's going to make it easier for you to lose some of that isolation, which is just going to make the whole process move along a whole lot easier. Yeah, it, it's a big part of it. The nervous system is, you know, the person's still in shock, you know, or, or they're, they're holding the trauma inside deeply. And it, it really allows the person to relax and, and let the nervous system to kind of calm down. Um, I had a conversation a while back with Dr. Robert Scare regarding trauma, and we looked at a lot of the different things and a lot of different methods that people use to work through trauma. And one of the big things that he had shared with me is that if you don't get past this first point, then you're going to have a hard time getting a person to change the rest of the way through. So sometimes where people go wrong and they're trying to tap on this is they're trying to jump into the details of what specifically happened in the traumatic experience. But the person literally, their nervous system has to calm down first and they've got to be able to become present with where they're at and what they're feeling in order to get into the other aspects. And that makes perfect sense. You know, as long as, as long as I feel isolated, I'm going to feel unsafe. And when I feel unsafe, it's going to be really difficult for me to be honest with what I'm experiencing and go into the detail of what's going on. Because since I feel unsafe, going to a place that is less safe with more of that emotional detail is something that's going to be really, really difficult for me to do. Yeah, it, it's rapport is a really big thing that we've got to make sure that we get with our clients, um, you know, or patients and, and helping them to feel, you know, connected and, and to feel that you're on that level with them. If they don't feel that you're on that level with them and they're feeling judged or they're feeling separate in any way, shape, or form, they're going to have a hard time letting go or letting down their wall, and, and the results are going to be minimal. So then after we've at a high level dealt with the unexpected, dramatic, isolating, no strategy portion of it, you said then go into detail. So I'm guessing for something like this, we're moving on to something like tearless trauma, the movie technique, where we're just kind of walking them through the experience itself to deal with the details of what's going on. Um, yeah, it, it just, it depends. We might have to do a couple rounds of getting the person down. Um, what happens is every person is, is an individual. So different things are going to affect people differently. So usually for the first round or two, you know, you get somebody calmed down. There might have been something specific of what I had said, whether it might be the isolating aspect of it, whether it might be the intensity of all these emotions. Um, it could also be that the person starts to pick up the fact that they don't know what to do. They don't know how to get to a state of state safety. And so, you know, I haven't mentioned this here, but, you know, a big part of this is that fight, flight, freeze response. And when we can't fight and we can't run from a situation, we stay frozen in it. And a lot of people, when they're in shock, they, they go to the freeze response. And when they're in this freeze response, that's when the, you know, all of these different neurological situations happen inside the brain with the amygdala and these chemicals are getting released and they, they don't know where to go with it. They're just, they're in shock and they're freezing. So it might be the physical action of, I don't know, know how to create safety. And so you have to start working on that part of it, or it might be, you know, uh, I have so many emotions that I'm feeling where I want to fight. I want to flee. I want to cry, you know whatever it might be, you have to meet the person where they're at and you start to work down to those specifics. And I think that's, that's really important to, when we look at something that is so multifaceted as being caught in trauma, 
is to recognize the fact that it's not a single round of tapping and it's not a single issue, that there are multiple layers to this, the four that we've talked about that creates the trauma, then the actual details of the experience, and then each of the emotional responses that we might feel after the fact for feeling guilty because we survived and someone else didn't, feeling stupid because we put ourselves in that situation and we should have known better, or at least that's what we think after the fact. And giving ourselves the permission that when we're tapping for something like this to take it really slow and systematically go through each of the things that present themselves so that we're clearing the way for all of the healing that needs to happen and not feel as if, okay, I had this traumatic event since it was one instance, I can just tap on one thing and it's going to be done. But the way that you're laying this out in all of these layers provides a really good template for us to kind of step in and break this apart in different ways. Yeah. You know, again, the, the big important thing with um, dealing with trauma is, you know, it's not one of those things that you can just do a generalized tapping on and the person's going to be able to move on because we are all so individual and we filter the world differently and we see the world differently and we have different beliefs and we've been through different things. All of these situations affect how we see the current event happening And a lot of times what's going to happen to us, especially if we have a huge overreaction to the traumatic event, then there's probably a little PTSD in there as well. And there's a previous event that maybe happened in childhood or adolescence or somewhere that might be reminding us of this current event. You know, maybe mom said you should never travel. You know, it's not safe to travel. Or, you know, you knew somebody who, you know, got in a Uh, an accident or what have you in a similar situation and your brain hasn't consciously linked up that these two things are connected. But if we're doing our job correctly and we're working through these different parts, you know, and we're listening and we're going slow with a person, then we can get to those specific things that might be a PTSD thing for the person and help that person clear that out as well, which in return will help the current traumatic event that the person is processing. Well, excellent. Well, Jen, I really appreciate the kind of systematic approach to all of this. Thanks for your time. Sure, absolutely. I hope you enjoyed that and recognize the really key portion of that, which is to see the event through those four particular lenses. And when we identify those four particular parts, it gives us a really specific entry point for us to be able to do our tapping. If you'd like to have more information about Jen and the work that she is doing, simply go to tappingqnapodcast.com, click on the link for episode 229 at tappingqnapodcast.com. You will find a link to Every single one of our previous episodes, between the full episodes, the bonus episodes, the extra tap along audios there, we are closing in on 300 resources. They're absolutely free of charge. You're doing yourself a disservice if you aren't taking advantage of all of the amazing resources that are there. Absolutely free. You can subscribe in iTunes, in Google Music Play, in TuneIn, in Stitcher. We have a pod, uh, iTunes app. We have an Android app. All of that stuff is absolutely free of charge. Just before recording this, I checked, and we are still the number one podcast for tapping an EFT in the Google Music Store because we are still the only podcast for tapping an EFT in the Google Music Store. We're number one. I appreciate the support. If you have a question, if you have a comment, if you'd like to see us cover something in the future, you can go to tappingqna.com and click on contact or click on the contact link um, inside of the app. And I just added it. We're going to be doing a podcast in August where I'm going to be answering your questions. And so you have a chance to leave some audio feedback. Just go to tappingqna.com slash ask. That's A-S-K, tappingqna.com slash ask. And you will have an opportunity to leave a voicemail for me. And we will include those voicemails in a future episode. And I will respond directly to your questions. For the Tapping Q&A podcast, this is Gene Montrostelli. I hope you have a great day, and I will talk to you real soon. Bye-bye. The Tapping Q&A podcast is copyright Gene Montrostelli, Tapping Q&A 2016. 
All views expressed by guests are those of the guests and not necessarily of Gene Montrestelli or Tapping Q&A.